We have already seen a bounded model checking encoding with that, and uh, today I would like to show you a bounded model checking encoding with QBF. The advantage of uh, using QBF is that we will avoid um, a blow up which we have in that, and the blow up was that we needed to copy the transition relation uh, for each step we uh, want to consider. Okay, so uh, let's quickly recapitulate how bounded model checking uh, in, in the case of safety checking looked like. So we have given a grip structure K um, and uh, we want to know if there is a path of length uh, small k to a bad state such that um, in this bad state a certain property is violated. So if we do k steps uh, is it possible to reach a state uh, where a certain property is violated? In other words, we want to check uh, whether there is a path uh, on which P does not globally hold. And for this purpose, uh, in order to show that there is a problem, we have to find a finite counter example. So after a certain number of steps, there will be um, a state that we reach uh, where the property is violated. And the idea of bounded model checking in the symbolic encoding uh, using that was to consider paths of a fixed length k, um, encode the full problem to a propositional formula phi, pass the problem to a SAT solver if the SAT solver says the formula is true, then um, there is a state, then there is a bad state, and uh, otherwise if uh, the formula is false, then this uh, can be either because um, the implementation we are considering is correct and there is no problem, or uh, we did not do enough steps. So if we choose the k too small, then um, the approach is incomplete. Um, and if we choose the k too large, then we might do extra work. And we already discussed also some techniques how uh, to choose the k uh, based on, on the notion of uh, the diameter of the graph. Okay, so in more concretely, the formula we obtained looked as follows. Uh, what we had is, we said, okay, in S0 there is the initial state, and uh, from this uh, state S0, or... Um, at, or at a time point zero, uh, we are in initial state, and then we can take one step um, from time point zero in time point one, from a state S0 to a state S1, then uh, in, in time, time point two, we are in um, state S2, by taking a step from S1, from the state we are in time point one, uh, to this uh, state we are in time point 2 and uh, we do this k times and at time point k we are in state sk and uh, in sk we are in a bad state where the property is violated that we are checking. Yeah, so this t is an encoding of the transition relation uh, of represented or given by the Kripke structure, now represented as a propositional formula. We have seen several techniques how to extract uh, these uh, propositional formulas to represent uh, Kripke structures. And um, we also uh, considered this example, uh, mutual exclusion, where we have two processes which share one resource. And um, we have two um, state variables p and q and if 
p is true, then process p takes the resource. If q is true, then process q takes the resource. And um, we want to know if we can reach a state where both processes access the resource at the same time. Yeah, this is a very small Klipka structure, um, but still it uh, already shows the most important concepts. We have here one initial state. Uh, we have some non-determinism here. And yeah, by just looking at this structure, we see that the problematic state D is reachable in two steps. Okay, but for um, solving it with that, we encoded it in uh, in this uh, formula we have here. Um, so we have the current state and we define how the successor state uh, looks like uh, when doing a valid step in a transition uh, according to the um, grip structure. And then we have seen how to encode um, such a transition relation, relation in uh, Limbol. Limbol is a SAT solver that is uh, able to process um, propositional formulas in uh, not only in, in conjunctive normal form like most state of the art solvers, but it um, can handle formulas of arbitrary structure. Hence, we have uh, implic uh, equivalence in there and we can uh, nest operators arbitrarily so we are not restricted to CNF. In the case of uh, satisfiability checking, we call it with the minus S option and then we check satisfiability. And um, yeah, this is the encoding to SAT. Um, if we want to do two steps, we have to copy this um, formula representing the transition relation and um, introduce new variables for representing the uh, state at time point two. So we have uh, variables for um, states at time point zero. We have states variables for time point one and we have state variables for time point two. And this um, encoded respectively with uh, Limbool and we have seen uh, how to do two or three steps uh, with Limbool. Yeah, here I have now doing three steps. And uh, okay, what was missing? Uh, this I have now not on the slides here. Um, is we we had to encode to encode uh, the initial state, which was simply adding unit literals, not p and not q. And uh, this um, says that we start in, in state in the state where p is false and q is false, which is state A. And we had to uh, include the bad property and there we said it holds after um, two steps here in this case and then we had to say that uh, the p next to variable and the q next to variable is um, are both true and um, we have seen then that the formula uh, is um, indeed satisfiable and that we could reach the bad states are the two steps. Yeah. Now I would like to show you how to do it with QBF. Um, the idea is to use quantification to avoid um, this copying of the transition relation. The problem is that this uh, transition relation encoding can be very large even if uh, this, this symbolic representation of the transition relation. And um, with QBF, the complexity of this application is um, shifted towards a, or is hidden within the quantification, which we uh, then introduce. Um, there are different ways of doing it, and 
um, there are diff also different encodings. Uh, I just would like to show you a very simple one um, and uh, discuss how how this uh, works. Okay, so again we want to do safety checking. So we want to know if a bad state can be reached after k steps. So if at time point k we are in a state uh, where a given property is violated um, and uh, we also start in um, initial state um, at time point zero. So the initial state is a zero. And uh, what we also use is the transition relation, but um, this time we use it only one time. But the, in principle, the encoding is the same. Okay, and uh, what we now um, do is we do the following. Um, we say there exists uh, a state at time point zero, a state at time point one, a state um, at time point k minus one, at stated time point k, um, such that S0 is the initial state and um, Sk is the bad state. And, uh, and this is what we have here now, is that it's possible to do a step from S0 to S1, from S1 to S2, and so on, until uh, Sk is reached according to the transition uh, transition relation described by the grid structure. Um, now we do not do this by explicitly copying this um, um, this transition relation, but what we do is we introduce uh, two uh, universally quantified um, state variables and um, we say um, x is uh, current state, x prime is the successor state. And um, what we do now is, is say, we do a disjunction and say x is si, x prime is the same as si plus one. So if the two states, if there are two states, um, which are selected here, and if they are, um, consecutive states, yeah, so we have i and i plus 1, so they um, are next to each other in, in, in our timeline. So from si, um, I can go to si plus 1 in one step. Um, so if x is si and x prime is si plus 1, uh, then it has to hold that uh, we can do this step from x to x prime. Okay, and uh, what is important is we have to remember here the uh, semantics of the implication. Um, quickly remember, A implies B uh, is only true if uh, A is false or B, B is true. If we have the case um, so only if we have the case that A is true and B is false uh, then uh, we get a false. Yeah? And in, in particular in our example uh, now if um, so for, for the for the uh, variables x and x prime or for the states possible states represented by x and x prime, all possibilities have to be considered in order to evaluate the formula to true. And um, if we have um, a combination here, um, say uh, x is bound to s0 and um, x prime, is bound to S5. Um, yeah. Uh, then um, this um, left hand side of the implication uh, evaluates 
to uh, force. Um, so um, maybe let's do a concrete example to see uh, how, how it looks like. So we have, um, say, x is s1, s2, and s S1, 0, S1, and S2, and for all x, x prime, it holds that uh, S0 is an initial state, and uh, we want to know if S2 is a bad state, and, and now we do this uh, disjunction, we say um, x is equivalent to s zero and x prime is equivalent to s one or uh, x is equivalent to s one and x prime is equivalent to s uh, two. Yeah, so uh, we can go from S0 to S1, from S1 to S2. Uh, uh, yeah. And uh, this implies that um, we can go from X to X prime. Um, and that's it. That's the QBF encoding of the bounded model checking, uh, the problem or one encoding of bounded model checking with QBF. Um, the only thing is usually um, in a state where states are not encoded only by one bit, but we have multiple bits. Uh, but um, let's um, do it now with um, a solver and see how how this um, works. Uh, for this purpose, I have extended uh, the SAT solver Limbool, which we have already uh, used for solving propositional formulas, um, such that it's now also able uh, to process uh, QBFs. So I have now a solver, uh, a SAT solver Limbool. Let me just show you a small example uh, uh, so what we have now is um, we have existential variables which are um, marked by a question mark uh, so say we have exists a and universal variables are marked by a hash and important uh, the uh, quantifier Fires are allowed only to be in a prefix, so we have prenix normal form, but the matrix can be of arbitrary structure. So we have exists A for all B, and let's check A is equivalent to B. And uh, then we give this uh, formula to Limbool, and now Q Limbool, and uh, the formula was called X1, and uh, as expected, it says that the formula is false. If uh, we change quantifiers like that, give here and ask for all A, is there a B? And then Limbour says it's true. Uh, if the outermost um, quantify uh, variables, if the outermost most variables are existentially quantified uh, and the formula is true, then it returns also an assignment for these variables. So if we have ask, is there a C such that for all B, uh, for all A there exists a B and let's now modify the formula that we say uh, it's A is equivalent to B and C. And if we now solve this, uh, then the QBF solver says, yeah, um, this formula is true and uh, C has to be set to 1. Okay, so now let's uh, use Limbool or the extended variant of Limbool to solve a bounded model checking problem. For this purpose I have copied um, the uh, transition, transition relation which we already 
um, I have seen before to a, uh, to a file and uh, we will now extend this um, to get um, a bounded model checking problem um, for, for safety checking uh, doing one and two steps but let's start with one step so uh, for doing one step we need um, existentially quantified variables p0 uh, q0 for state at time point zero then we need um, variables p1 and q1 which are also also existentially quantified uh, and then we need universally quantified variables p uh, q p next and q next okay and um, here we have uh, one copy of the transition uh, relation with q and p and p next and q next so p and q represent the x variable which we had on the slide and uh, q next and p next are the, the primed x good now let's see what happens if we give this formula to q limbool It says it's a force formula and yeah, this is not um, so surprising because um, here we have a formula now that consists only of universally quantified um, variables. Okay, um, now what's happening if we say we want to do one step from uh, um, state at time point zero at time point to state at time one one now here we have now to introduce the implication and we say p is equivalent to p zero and q is equivalent to q zero and um, p uh, next is equivalent to p one and um, q next is equivalent to Q1 and I hope I have no typo here and uh, this implies um, the transition relation so when P and Q are set to uh, P0 and Q0 and Q ne P next is uh, P1 and Q next is Q1 then it should be possible to do one uh, step yeah? for for all other combinations which are not according to the values found by this ex given by this existentially quantified variables um, we immediately get true um, because then the uh, left hand side of the implication is false okay now let's see what what happens and I really hope I did not do a typo and uh, we get a true formula and uh, it says we can go from state 1 0 to state 0 0 yeah what we now um, or what we did not have so far is um, enforcing that 0 0 is the initial state so we have to add not p0 and uh, not q0 and what is also important is that we put this here into parentheses, otherwise uh, the conjunction binds stronger and we do not have the meaning that we want to have and now uh, we indeed start in state 0, 0 and we go to uh, state 1, 0. Now uh, we can ask if state, if the state we reach in one step is a bad state um, how do we do this? Uh, we say P1 is true and uh, Q1 is true, as we do again by unit literals. Um, the rest of the formula is not in CNF, but uh, by having them conjunctively added, this enforces the value. And now the formula is false as expected, uh, because um, as we see um, from the Kripke structure, we cannot reach state 1, 1 
in within with one step. Now let's do two steps. For this, we have to add uh, the state variables of uh, S2. So we need P2 and uh, Q2. Um, we add them as existentially quantified variables and we say the bad state is not uh, P1 and Q1 anymore, but P2 and Q1 anymore. And uh, what we have to do is we have now to say, um, copy this and uh, we, we have to say this um, is one step and um, or um, if uh, p is equivalent to p1 and q is equivalent to q1 and uh, q p next is equivalent to p2 and q next is equivalent to q2. Okay, so now we have um, an encoding with uh, two steps. Let's see if the parentheses are okay. So if um, we are going from state 0 to state 1, uh, this should be possible with the translation relation, or if we're going from state 1 to state 2, this should be possible with a transition relation. And now let's see what um, happens. I have um, done, I have omitted some parentheses. Uh, where is it missing? Yeah, we have, uh, what is missing? Uh, here should be one. this and this yep okay so second try ah yeah and now the formula is true uh, we can go from state um, zero zero to state one zero and then to state one one and if we look at the slides let's see if we find them here let's go back to the example then we go from zero zero to one zero to one one and this is indeed a path to a state uh, where p is true and q is true yeah so this is the qbf encoding of um or one qbf encoding for safety checking with qbfs And um, yeah, this example is now very small and we do not really see um, the benefits of um, having um, this encoding instead of the SAT-based encoding. But uh, imagine that the Kripke structure is large, then uh, also um, this here would be large, this um, encoding of the transition relation. And uh, then it's much smaller just to have this equivalence is saying from state zero I go to state uh, I go to state one from state one I go to zero, zero and so on and just um, encode the trans uh, the constraints how to do this uh, transition only one yeah. uh, but um, yeah uh, here this this example is rather small in order uh, to illustrate how it works but uh, I hope it's it's clear that uh, we um, now shift this uh, complexity or so resolve this complexity of copying the transition relation uh, by, by using universal quantification. And uh, this is, I think, a very nice uh, feature or a nice trick that can be done with QBFs. So far we have seen symbolic encodings for implementations which are then uh, modeled in terms of Kripke structure. Um, however, for, for programs, um, for software programs, this is not um, maybe the most uh, ideal way of representing them. And uh, in the following, we will see how um, the idea of bounded model checking can be transferred to software 
um, containing loops and pointers and concepts like that. Um, so the basic idea is uh, to unwind the given program into equations uh, such that we can check these equations uh, by using a SAT or an SMT solver. SMT stands for Satisfiability Model of Theories and uh, it gives us background theories into the reasoning such that we can for have, for example, numbers or arrays or uninterpreted functions um, and do not have to talk only about uh, Boolean variables. And um, especially for program verification, this is extremely valuable. The approach um, I will present is completely automated, so there is not uh, um, any manual step involved that uh, requires experience or a strong background, but it can translate a given program directly into, into a formula, which then is checkable by a solver. And this approach also works for pointers and dynamic memory allocation, uh, but it requires that the logic supports respective concepts. And so far we will only focus on basic print uh, concepts and um, do not consider pointers and dynamic memory allocation. Properties um, are very different, it can be checked, it can be simple assertions, which are Boolean expressions saying uh, which that, that a certain property has to hold at a certain execution time. Um, many, many programming languages offer an assert statement and um, this, um, the, the Boolean expressions contained in an assert statement can be trans translated uh, into uh, an expression to be included in a, in a um, logical formula. Certain runtime errors can be detected, uh, like uh, memory access violations or uh, runtime guarantees can be checked. So if a um, certain state is reached within uh, a given a number of execution steps. And yeah, we will focus on uh, simple assertion properties but uh, I also wanted to mention that much more is possible. And uh, a tool that implements uh, bounded model checking for C programs is the tool CPMC. Uh, and uh, here is uh, the paper mentioned where, where the, the basic ideas are described and uh, some of the ideas realized in the CPMC tool I will present in the following. So uh, first of all, one challenge in, in uh, verification is to deal with side effects that certain programming languages and program language concepts have. And uh, in order to um, handle these, or we, we have to get rid of them. Uh, so for example, if we have an expression J um, is set to i++, where we have on the one hand the increment of the variable i and on the other hand the assignment. Uh, we rewrite this into two steps um, and we say, okay, j is set to i and i is increased by one. And so uh, we have eliminated the side effect. We have um, on the one hand the assignment and on the other hand the incremental of the variable. Then um, certain control uh, flow um, statements are made explicit. So in a loop we could have a continue or break statement and uh, then it's not explicitly state where to continue and uh, this uh, can be uh, simplified by using uh, go-to statements. Uh, then uh, programming languages or C programs offer different kinds of loops like for loops or do while loops and uh, all 
loops are first translated to while loops where the condition is in the top and the head and these while loops are then can then all be treated in the same way and they are unwound meaning that we eliminate them by doing some loop unrolling such that um, each um, each execution uh, of the or each iteration of the loop has uh, is um, explicitly represented and this is the bounded model checking idea which we have here um, we um, include um, k copies of the um, of the body of the loop and uh, this means uh, we bind the loop, we introduce a bound, and um, hence, the, hence the analysis might become incomplete. Um, we have to, what is important is to um, select the bound in such a way that uh, the interesting uh, executions are covered. Uh, for some, in some cases, the, the loop bounds can be found automatically and it can be uh, derived how often a loop has to be uh, copied or how often the body of a loop has to be copied. Um, however, this is a hard problem in general and this is not always be possible. Then the user has to say um, how, how to select um, the bound and uh, how often is of interest to um, have copies of the loop. And in order to ensure that unwinding is done often enough, um, unwinding assertions are added. Um, these are assertions which should only be reached when, um, when uh, a, a loop is not copied often enough. Uh, we will see an example uh, where it's shown how it works. Okay, so here we have um, some function which contains uh, a while loop and then some rest afterwards and uh, we say we will copy it uh, three times. So we have here the condition and the body and as long as the condition is uh, true then uh, the body will be executed and uh, we copy it here now three times so if the condition holds then body is executed then again if the condition still holds then the body is executed and again if the condition holds then the body is executed and in the last um, if statement we include this assertion uh, where we say uh, assert not condition and if we uh, reach this assertion uh, then this uh, gives us an error. So an assertion is a statement uh, provided by many programming languages that um, takes a boolean uh, expression as a or a boolean uh, statement as um, an argument and if um, this um, argument evaluates to true, nothing happens, and um, if uh, it evaluates to false, uh, then an error is reported. Yeah? And so if we have not unwound the, um, the loop often enough, then we reach this assert statement. This happens only if we, if we have not, if, if the condition still holds, uh, which would again lead to the execution. Of, um, of the while loop and uh, if we did not do this often enough then uh, we reach this assert statement and we get an error and we know we have to increase the bound. Okay, uh, then um, in, in boolean form or in, in formulas, in logical formulas it's not possible to um, have states, we have only variables which can uh, take a certain value 
And in order to deal with this, um, we have to find a single static assignment uh, form of a program. Uh, so for each left-hand side of each assignment, we introduce a fresh variable. Yeah? And if we have here this uh, very tiny program saying uh, that variable x is assigned x plus y, so we have the x occurring on the right-hand side and on the left-hand side. Then we have assigned x here uh, to with uh, two times x, and then here we have some array with some index uh, variable. And for all all these, uh, we introduce some fresh uh, variables uh, such that uh, we do not have. Um, uh, case that, an, uh, uh, that a variable is assigned a value twice so um, yeah now we do not know what's happened before but say um, the, the recent name of x is now x0 and the recent name of y is now y, y0 and uh, then uh, x1 x is uh, now x1 and this is very similar as we had it in, in the encoding in of the bounded model checking uh, problem in, in SAT. There for each step we also had to introduce uh, fresh variables. So we had variables for time point zero, variables for time point one, variables for time point two and so on. And this is uh, in principle the same idea we have here. Now we introduce a fresh variable for x at time point two and um, yeah we do this per execution step. Here for the array we have to uh, consider the array variable as well as the index variable um, which need to be indexed. And now if we have this representation we can easily translate it into a formula, into an SMT formula which knows numbers and arrays. Um, so we can say x1 is equal to uh, x0 plus y0 and x2 is equal to x1 times y, uh, times 2 and we, we also have um, an equation on the array. And note that these are not assignments here but these are Boolean expressions um, and uh, we say that x1 has the same value as x0 plus y0 and with SMT we, we have now uh, interpreted, interpreted of, uh, function symbols and this plus here stands for the arithmetical plus. Yeah? And this is some uh, things that we could not do with that, but which uh, is uh, a feature that is provided by SMT. And uh, yeah, again, here we have some theory of integers most likely and um, arrays. Okay, and um, now what's happening if we have uh, an if then else statement then uh, for each um, uh, we said for, for each um, left hand side assignment we introduce a fresh variable but now what is if the variable is assigned in the if branch and in the else branch as we have it here yeah what we um, do have to do is we have to introduce uh, new variables with selectors at the join point. So when we're branching and we returning to one uh, position again, uh, then we have to introduce um, join points, which looks as follows. So if we have the statement, if we, then x is assigned to y, else x is assigned to z, and uh, then uh, we continue with some execution where we use the x. And um, we do the single static assignment, um, we assume that uh, we has also been uh, renamed somewhere. So if we zero, then um, we say x zero is y zero, and otherwise x one is uh, set zero. And uh, now we have to <laughs> merge them somehow again, and uh, we do this as following. Uh, we say x two is um, based uh, on the value of v0 
if it's if v zero is true, then uh, x two is x zero, and otherwise x two is x one, and then uh, we have captured the values of x in this variable x two, and we can say w one is x two. Yeah, and um, this uh, gives us this representation of the if then else statement. Okay. Uh, yeah, here we have a, an, another example. So uh, we have a variable y and an if then else statement. And uh, here is a minus missing. This should be y minus minus. So depending on the value of x, the y is decreased or it's increased. And uh, then we have an uh, assert statement uh, which states that y should be either 2 or 3. And um, this assert statement now we include in the formula um, and use it as the property to be checked. And uh, what we say if if this representation of the formula is, um, we will see it soon, is uh, true, uh, then the property has to hold. Um, otherwise, if if this um, if this part is does not evaluate to true, then we also do not have to check the assertion, and uh, this way model if the implication. Yeah? Okay, but let's have a look how we go from the C program to the uh, symbolic uh, encoding uh, in a more detailed way. So uh, we do the single static assignment um, uh, and say y, the, the y1 is 1. Uh, if x0, which has been defined somehow before, is true, then uh, y2 is y1 minus 1. Otherwise, y3 is y1 plus 1. Uh, then we need to join um, the results of or the, the assignments of the if statements. y4 is uh, y2 if x0 is true and otherwise it's y3. And uh, for the assert statement, uh, we, we check the value of y4. So y4 is either 2 uh, or uh, it's 3. Yeah, this now we can directly translate into a formula. We take this um, y1 is 1 and y2 is y1 minus 1, y3 is y1 plus 1. Um, then we have this um, if then else statement y4 is uh, y2 if x is if x0 is true, otherwise it's y3. And only if this formula can be satisfied, so if we can find an execution of the program um, such that um, these constraints we have now introduced are satisfied, uh, then we check the assertion. And um, yeah, this is simply saying y4 is 2 or y4 is 3. Yeah? So this is a, a Boolean comparison, the equal symbol here. So already close to SMT syntax. Okay, and um, this formula we can translate into SMT format. For example, SMTlib2, give it to uh, an SMT solver and ask if uh, this uh, is uh, true or false. If this formula is true, then uh, this means uh, that um, if this formula is false, then this means that um, here this um, uh, this part uh, this means uh, oops, that this part of the formula is true, but the assertion is false, and uh, then the assertion is violated, and we have to check why this is the case. Okay, so let's proceed. 
Um, what I would also like to show you is how arrays could be handled um, <coughs> before we um, uh, show one symbolic way of um, handling arrays um, without using uh, a soul word that explicitly implements arrays which are also available but I will show you a different approach without <laughs> for handling arrays without having arrays in the logic. Um, let's uh, quickly discuss the core uh, properties of arrays which are given by these three axioms we have here. Um, so first of all uh, for all arrays and in its index variables a and j it holds if uh, the indices i and j are the same then uh, read um, a i is the same as read a j so read is a, a function that um, has as first argument an array and the second um, argument the index variable and it uh, tells us the value of array a at position i and if uh, two variables i and j are the same then uh, read a i is the same as read a j this is the first axiom so if i read something at the same position no matter how the, vari the index variable is called um, then this should give us the same value then we have uh, read over write. If I have uh, now the write function, uh, which says um, at in array A at position I value V is um, set. And uh, the first um, re the first read over write um, axiom says the following. For all arrays, all values, all index variables, i and j, it holds. If uh, i and j have the same value, and I write a value v at position i in array a, and then if I then read at position j, which we said is the same as i, uh, then this is the same as value v. Yeah. So if I write something at position i and read it afterwards, then I um, see exactly this value. And uh, the other axiom uh, that we have is if uh, the index variables are different and I did some uh, writing at some position i, so I updated array a at position i with value v, and uh, then I read at a different position j, uh, then this would have been the same as if I had directly read at position j. Yeah? So if I, if I do some update of the array uh, at, some, uh, at a given position i, then it doesn't affect the other positions um, of the array. Okay, so with these um, uh, three axioms, um, array properties could be captured and these are used to model memory in hardware or software. And uh, when we want to have a solver that can reason about arrays, then these, um, these uh, axioms need to be um, considered. But what I uh, will show you now is an example uh, where we can deal or handle arrays with, by just using uninterpreted functions, so functions which do not have uh, a special um, semantics. Yeah, um, And uh, these are uninterpreted functions as we have it, for example, in first order logic. But um, I haven't introduced first order logics now, um, so uh, I, I think this can also be understood by some intuition or the basic idea can, can be understood by some intuition.
So if we have um, a construction like this, we uh, have a read um, from uh, we, we read um, an array at position j, which is updated uh, at position i by value v. Yeah. So first, so by this nesting, we write array. We write value v at position i in array a, and uh, then we read at position j. If and and this we can now replace by the following um, statement: If i equals j, then uh, this read uh, will give us value v, and otherwise uh, we will have read um, uh, uh, of a at position j. Yeah. So we we completely eliminate the right um, and just use this um, statement here yeah and, and now let's um, consider the following formula which could model a small program and um, let's see how, how we can evaluate it okay so first of all we know that the index variables are different so a um, and j are different and uh, we also require that variables u and v have different values okay and now we have v defined as uh, read a at position j and the u is a bit complicated uh, we have read write a i v at position j okay and um, this is exactly the expression we have here above and uh, now we do this trick and replace this read write expression by this if then else statement and uh, we get a new formula uh, and uh, u is now defined um, by this uh, if then else uh, statement okay uh, but now we know that i and j are different Hence, we can simplify this um, uh, statement and say u is read of a j because we know that i and j are different and therefore only the else branch is of interest. Yeah? And we get this new formula um, where we have i is different to j, we have a definition of u, we have a definition of v, and we have um, furthermore the constraint that u and v are different okay but when we now look at the formula we see that read aj occurs here and it occurs here and um, because of transitivity uh, we can now uh, conclude that u equals read aj and uh, this read, yeah, is, is the same as the read aj here and this is the same as v but if we have this we can conclude that u has to be the same as v but here we state that uh, u and v are different and uh, therefore um, the formula is unsatisfiable yeah and we were now able to um, evaluate a formula that contained array operations without uh, having a dedicated few results for array but we simply could use um, um, reasoning on uninterpreted functions what we did and um, also dealing with with equalities yeah and uh, with such tricks um, very efficient symbolic encodings for um, reasoning on programs can be realized um, and uh, yeah this uh, directly brings us to SMT solving uh, which we will consider in the next part. I will introduce SMT and uh, the input language of SMT solver which is called SMT lib in terms of a simple example. 
and uh, this is again from a verification domain. So we do a symbolic encoding of a program and um, solve or check its um, soundness in terms in terms of an uh, SMT problem. Okay, the program we are considering is as follows. It's a very simple program. We have only uh, if then else um, statements in there, so there are no loops, no complicated memory allocation, and um, we are having uh, free integers as input, as argu input arguments, and uh, the program is supposed to return the middle uh, number um, as a result. So when we order the three numbers, then the one in the middle should be returned. Okay, and here is the code uh, of the program. It's not so complicated. We, we do some comparison. And uh, if this is the case, if y is smaller than z, then we check if x is smaller than y, and then m um, is the return value. Um, and yeah, here we have the different cases, and the question is, now uh, does the program really do what it is supposed to do? And we could do this by testing, so we could write a lot of um, tests and call the program, and here I, I have a lot of tests, and all show that the program behaves uh, as it is supposed to behave. However, uh, this is uh, very da dangerous because um, testing, or it's very dangerous to assume that after even extensive testing a program is correct because testing is never complete and it's very easy to overlook a case um, which um, leads to an incorrect uh, result. And in our program, this is indeed the case that we missed a test case. So if we give 2, 1 and 3 as input, uh, then um, the expected output would be 2, but instead the program returns 1. Yeah, now we could, when we have this test case, we can use this information for debugging. Um, so we check uh, y is smaller than z. This is indeed the case. 1 is smaller than 3. Now we check if x is smaller than y. x um, is not smaller than y uh, because we have here uh, 2 and 1. So we go here. If we have x is smaller than z, um, this is indeed the case and then uh, we return y and this is 1 but instead we should uh, return the 2 yeah but um, it would be nice if we could more automize this and find the bug also detect on the first hand that there is a bug and then also where is the bug and um, this we will now do um, with a, a simple SMT program. For this purpose, uh, we first of all need a specification uh, telling us what this middle program is supposed to do. And uh, there are different ways how to come up with a specification. I, I use the following. Um, I say um, x, y and z are the variables um, which should be considered and which give us the input numbers. And, and what we do now is we assign x to an array at position i, we assign j, uh, y to an array at position j, and um, we assume uh, we assign z to an array at position k. Um, we also um, formulate that the indices are different, so i is different to j, i is different to k, and j is different to k. Yeah? So none of them has the same value. And we also say 
and this I haven't written down here, but we should also say that um, they all have uh, values between zero and two. Yeah? So the index, index variables a, j and k are all different and they are in the range of zero to two. And um, what we also then require is that um, in a zero, there is the smallest number. So a zero is smaller than a one and in a two is the biggest number. So a one is smaller than a two. And if all of these constraints hold, then we can conclude that um, the middle value is in A1. Note that coming up with this uh, specification is a manual process, so this um, we could not derive automatically from the program, uh, but uh, we had to describe very concisely what our program is supposed to do. Uh, however, if we have the program, then translating this to an SMT formula is much simpler. Um, in this case, it's, it's really extremely simple because we have no complicated assignments and we do not need um, single assignments because um, there is... Um, Yeah, the, the, the M variables in principle only set once, except for this initialization. Yeah. Okay, and um, we, what we do now in um, encode here in SMT are these many if then else as we have. And we say if Y is smaller than Z and um, x is smaller than y, then m is y. This is this line here. If y is smaller than z, and this is not an else branch, x is greater or equal to y, and if x is smaller than z, then m is y. This is what we have here. And in this way we proceed until we have captured all branches and um, the last one is um, this is the uh, case where none of these uh, branches here apply and then we have m set to set what we have on the top here in the initialization yeah? so uh, based on the conditions which hold um, m is equal to the respective value. Okay, and um, this we can do automatically. So if we have given a program um, like this, then here no creativity is required. We can simply translate this program into an SMT formula. Okay, and uh, if we have that, um, we can now check um, the specification um, against the implementation and here we use a trick which we have already seen before um, we have P the encoding of the program as the specification and uh, the program is correct if this P implies S implication is valid so whenever the program formula is true and there is a solution to it, then uh, also the specification um, has to hold and has to have a solution. Uh, so we can, uh, SMT solvers also check satisfiability. So we need um, to use the trick with the negation. A program has a bug if P implies S is invalid. So if it has a counterexample, um, therefore the program has a bug if the negation of this implication is satisfiable because uh, the model of the negation is a counter model uh, to the original formula. And uh, now we can reformulate uh, this implication um, in uh, terms of 
um, of a conjunction. Um, so we have not P implies S is the same as P and not S. And we check if this is satisfiable. And if this is satisfiable, then we can uh, conclude that our program has a problem. Yeah. And um, now, uh, how does this look in detail? So for the program P, we have this uh, formula which we have seen before with this um, constraints encoding the if then else constructs. And uh, for the specification, we use the formula we have manually derived before. Important thing is that um, it is negated and um, here we um, simply uh, say that M is different to uh, array A at position 1. Okay, and um, if we look um, at the code, uh, then this looks like this. Um, here I should maybe say a little bit about it. So uh, this is a, f a formula representation uh, in SMTlib2 format. And um, yeah, I would like to go quickly over the language elements uh, in order to introduce them. So when uh, we use SMT, we first of all have to set the logic. And um, the reason is that uh, SMT is very flexible with respect to the concepts that are provided by a solver. And um, one could use um, all language elements, but then, um, or a lot of background theories, but then the reasoning becomes harder. And one should use them only carefully and only include those um, those background theories that are needed for reasoning. Okay, so we use quantifier free, so no quantifiers are included in the logic, um, arrays, uninterpreted functions and linear integer arithmetic. So we have numbers, we have arrays, and it's that's what we need for our um, for, so, for, for representing our problem in SMT. Then we have the, the, uh, a block of declarations where we introduce um, the symbols. Um, we have declare functions. For this, uh, the SMT lib provides declare functions. Uh, we do not provide any arguments um, and um, we type it. So it's a typed language, so we have to say the data type. Um, so x is an integer, y is an integer, z is an integer, i, j and k are integers and also m is an integer. Uh, only uh, only um, a is different, this is an array um, which has um, integer indices and integer values. Okay, and then we have the assertions, which are conjunctively connected. So um, if we have this list of conjunction, then this assertion has to hold and this and this and this and this. Uh, in SMTlib, uh, the operators are um, in uh, prefix notation. So we have first the operator and then the arguments. If we want to say um, and not uh, and uh, or if we want to say y is smaller than z, we write smaller y z. Uh, and if we want to have a conjunction of um, these two inequalities, we, we write and smaller y z smaller x y. And um, yeah, here we have now an implication. So this uh, conjunction here implies um, m is equal to y. This is the first assertion. And uh, what we have here is 
we have here all the assertions for a program uh, then what we need to do next is we have to encode the specification first of all we say that i is um, between 0 and 2 so 0 is smaller or equal to i and 2 is uh, and i is smaller or equal to 2 the same we do for the j and also for the k so all the three index variables are now in the range 0 to 2 okay then uh, next um, we have to say that um, x is in array a at position i and um, yeah this um, we do here and uh, then we have to introduce uh, the order and say um, the array with index the array element with index zero is the smallest then um, element with um, index one is in the middle and with index two is the largest um, furthermore we have to assert yeah here uh, this um, smaller equal operator like many operators it's not a binary operator but we can use it with n with an arbitrary number of arguments okay then we say uh, i j and k are distinct have distinct values and uh, then we say that m is uh, different uh, from the value a has at position 1. And uh, finally we call checksat which asks the solver to solve this formula and if the formula is satisfiable we can also ask for a model and yeah smdlib also now let's see what's happening if I copy the formula into, or uh, if I pass the formula to an SMT solver. Um, I will use the SMT solver Z3 by Microsoft, which has a web interface, which you find at riseforfun.com slash Z3. Uh, I first remove the demo example and insert my code, which um, I already had on the slides. Um, then I simply press the play button and let's see uh, what the solver says. The solver says the formula is satisfiable and uh, because of this get model uh, call uh, it tells me also values for the variables I declared and um, it, these are not the smallest values but they, these give a, an example why the formula is um, satisfiable and this uh, gives us a counterexample to our specification and um, indeed we have m as 2281 uh, which is the value of y uh, but uh, z is 2283 and x is 2282 uh, which should be the value in the middle yeah so the solver now totally found a, a solution in an automatic manner which gives us um, a concrete um, test case that triggers the bug which we have in the middle group. Uh, let's talk a little bit about SMT which we have already seen uh, very useful for the verification of software um, because it provided us uh, very high level constructs. Um, I will not go too much into detail here but give just a short introduction because there is so much to say about SMT that it could cover a full lecture. Yeah? So I will uh, just talk about some questions.
core concepts and uh, give you some uh, first impressions on that topic. So why is SMT of interest? It's uh, always a question of trading expressiveness against efficiency. And here SMT is a good compromise. When we talk about SAT solving, then we have a very, a very, a very efficient uh, formalism with um, um, highly tuned tools um, that work very well in practice, but the problem is, on the one hand, um, encoding a problem into SAT is quite involved because we have only Boolean variables and uh, no concepts like numbers or arrays or something that allows us to directly model memory. Instead, yeah, we have only the Boolean variables and um, this is what we have to work with and this makes comp encodings often very complicated. Uh, on the other hand, there are problems which are beyond MP, so they require um, other formalisms for efficient encodings and um, therefore um, one has to switch to other logics as well. Um, a very expressive language is first order logic. It offers a lot of language concepts, but uh, often it's too powerful. Often the, the concepts that are there are not needed and uh, they make the reasoning unnecessarily hard. And um, because of this, uh, it can be that uh, a first order, uh, order solver cannot decide a formula while it would be possible if, if some uh, language elements would not be considered which are not needed. So uh, first order logic is often too strong. Uh, because in practice uh, satisfiability with respect to some theory is required, so uh, not a full first order is necessary and non-standard interpretations are not of interest. So for example, uh, when we have the formula we see here uh, on the screen, then, um, then um, we want to read the plus as addition and this sign here as uh, comparator operator smaller than or less than. Yeah? And uh, we do not want to have any non-standard interpretation, but we want to have exactly uh, these, um, this meaning of the operator. And we know we, uh, not, not everything is expressible in first order logic and it's fine if we have some, something external. Yeah? So um, it's good if we have specialized inference theories, uh, inference methods for each theory. So we have dedicated solver that are solvers that are specialized on a certain theory and uh, that are extremely efficient on solving a very a certain kind of problem. And SMT is exactly the sweet spot between uh, SAT and first order logic. So here we have a good compromise between expressiveness and uh, efficiency. It's basically a propositional logic with domain specific reasoning. So we include, for example, numbers into the reason, in, into our formulas, or arrays, or strings, or whatever we need in order to solve our concrete application problem. And uh, in general, this uh, leads to more efficient solvers um, uh, than we have it with general purpose solvers, uh, which um, include dedicated theory axioms. So it would also be possible to have a first order, lo first order solver, and which has then a special theory reasoning on numbers, but in general it works better to come from SAT and um, extend it with um, theory reasoning. Uh, here I have an example of uh, of uh, an SMT formula. So here we have some uninterpreted functions. So there's no special meaning of f. Uh, we have uh, inequality. Um, so distinct. Um, we have plus. We have arrays. We have equality. And in uh, first order logic, uh, 
Uh, so did the formulas what we have here are princip in principle first order logic formulas but with severe restrictions. So usually we do not have quantifiers uh, and assume the variables to be existentially quantified. We have sorts, so the variables are typed. Um, so for example here we know that we are for example talking about integers. And um, we have functions, constants and predicates that are interpreted. Um, so this equality here um, and uh, this equality here is an interpreted symbol, this plus is an interpreted symbol and so on. And we have less reasoning power as we would have in uh, first order uh, solving, so we can um, solve the formulas much more efficient with an SMT solver because it, it has not to consider all possibilities that would be uh, possible in first order logic, but it can restrict and focus on the domain uh, that is under consideration. Nevertheless, the language is much richer than we have it in propositional logic because uh, now we have more than just Boolean variables. and. Um, SMT is very successful in many industrial applications um, and um, it's, it's really widely used because it's user-friendly and um, it, it has a standardized language which is called SMT-lib nowadays uh, most widely used in version 2 and this uh, language is used in applications, uh, in applications and competitions. Uh, the idea of SMT solving is quite old, it dates back to the 70s and uh, 80s, uh, but it was really, uh, it, it got a real boost in the 90s um, when uh, also SAT solving technology became very strong. SAT solving is also very old, but in the 90s uh, several techniques were developed that are essential for um, for have getting an efficient SAT solver and this also was then a tri driver for many other solving fields um, like uh, SMT solving but also for QBF solving and it was also a driver for, for applications like verification or planning that, that we will see soon and nowadays there are solvers that come from industry and academia for example there is um, C3, which was which is uh, developed by Microsoft, CVC4, which is from a group in Stanford mainly. Then there is um, Bulector, uh, which is a so solver from Linz, and uh, yeah, so there there is a vast interest, and not all solvers support all theories, but um, solvers focus on certain theories depending on on mainly on the background of the developers who, who uh, want them to use for solving their application problems. Uh, in principle, there are two solving approaches. There is the eager approach and the lazy approach. Eager approach um, simply translates uh, SMT, for, so <laughs> SMT uh, formula to some other, uh, some other formalisms like SAT and then a uh, SAT solver can be used to solve the SMT formula. The problem is that the formula size gets very huge, um, although there are very clever techniques to do this. And uh, so more prominent or yeah, together with an eager approach and realizing a hybrid approach is the lazy approach uh, where um, abstractions of the formula are evaluated and also here SAT solving plays an important role and um, then until uh, the abstraction is refined enough to give a definite answer then the, the approach terminates. Um, I will show you a um, very basic idea of a lazy approach a little bit later uh, but uh, before we do so uh, I will also talk about some uh, theory solving. Uh, the SMT solvers have in general a plug-and-play component. 
Uh, so important theories are uh, built in, like uninterpreted functions, equality, arithmetic, arrays and bit vectors, but the core technologies is such that it can uh, be easily extended with other theories as well. And the focus is usually on decidable theories, so um, it um, um, provides therefore fully automatic procedures and no manual intervention is necessary when an SMT, solvi uh, an SMT solver is used. And yeah, as I said, uh, no matter how the SMT solver is realized, it strongly builds on SAT solving. And um, yeah, I, I will talk about lazy SMT solver, which is um, a, a core idea in, in SMT solving and which can then be find to um, approaches that form uh, modern SMT solving technology. Uh, before we have a look at uh, SMT solving uh, in general, let's, um, as an example, consider the theory of equality with uninterpreted functions, such that you get a first impression how such a theory could look like. I could also have chosen, I don't know, linear integer arithmetics and then uh, show you how to solve uh, such formulas. I, I chose a very simple one because it's uh, very basic and implemented in almost all solvers and it also has a very nice um, solving algorithms. So we have uh, functions as we have them in first order logic. Uh, they are sorted or typed without any specific interpretation and um, the only interpreted predicate is um, equality and we have the following congruence axiom so for all x y it holds if x and y are equal then it follows that f of x is equal to f of y and uh, this could also be extended to functions with multiple arguments but um, this is more a technicality and I, I do not want to discuss this in detail here and uh, we have seen uninterpreted functions already before when we uh, wanted to reason about um, arrays and did not have a theory of arrays implemented. We could use it to uh, abstract from the arrays and uh, derive contradictions uh, based on these um, abstractions. Here we have an example. The formula contains uh, uninterpreted symbol f uh, but it also contains plus times equality um, and so on and uh, now assuming that we do not have uh, a theory solver to reason on uh, numbers we could also try what happens if we use an abstraction and we introduce an abstraction for the times which we call h and we introduce an abstraction for the plus uh, which we call G. Now let's just have a quick intuitive look at this uh, formula. Um, so the, the commas are ends. So A is equal to B. So H of A, so the H has its first argument, the A here, here the B. So in, in fact, this is also really an A. Uh, then a second argument is a G. Here we have an f of b, this is the same as a f of a, and here we have an f of a. Um, so, if, yeah, this could be replaced. And here we have f of c in, in both cases. So, uh, the um, two uh, uh, elements we have here with the h are the same, uh, but in one case it is equal to d, and in the other case it's different to e, and therefore we have a contradiction. So we. Uh, can immediately decide, decide that this, um, this set of equalities is inconsistent uh, by just considering the abstraction. So we do not need the meaning of plus and times in order to figure this out. Okay, and uh, I would like to show you as one example how to um, reason on uh, this uninterpreted function, so how one uh, algorithm would work, which um, 
uses this congruence property. We assume that uh, we have a flattened structure, so we have no nestings uh, of, of uh, functions. This can be easily achieved by, um, by yeah, doing something like the Zetin transformation we have already seen before, but uh, let's uh, assume we have the structure given. Uh, this is really not hard to get. And we put each variable into a, a separate equivalence class. And what we do now is we merge the equivalence classes until no further merging is possible. Uh, then we know that this, uh, this um, formula here is uh, satisfiable. Uh, otherwise, um, we, if we see that we have um, elements in one class which should be unequal, then we know we have a contradiction. Let's do this by the following example. Um, here we have um, x is equal to y. Um, so we immediately can put them into the same equivalent class. So we join these classes x and y and have only four classes left. Um, this gives us some new knowledge that x and y are the same. Uh, what we can do now is we can uh, replace, for example, this, in, in, I just do it in the head, we can uh, replace this y by x and then uh, we can derive, or by transitivity, we know that x equals g of x, g of x equals d, so we also use commutativity and therefore we can infer that uh, x and t are equal and uh, therefore it goes into the class of x and y. So we have now x, y, t into one class. Now we proceed as follows. Um, we consider uh, u is equal to f, x, t and v is equal to f, y, x. Okay, now we know that x and y are equal and that t and x are equal. So f, x, t is equal to f, y x and um, because of this and transitivity and commutativity again we can conclude that u is equal to v okay but then we have a contradiction because uh, here in the in the formula we, we state that u and v are different and therefore uh, we know that the formula is unsatisfiable Okay, so this was one example for reasoning on theories. Um, yeah. There are a lot of algorithms for the different theories, how to decide them. The point is we have given a set of so-called theory literals and we should decide if this uh, set is consistent or not. And if we have such a solver for reasoning on theories, we can uh, then build a full SMT solver and um, uh, how could, can we do it? So in general, an SMT formula is not just um, a conjunction of a theory literals, but it is um, it is uh, an arbitrary nested propositional formula. So we can have uh, Boolean operators uh, in uh, arbitrary uh, arrangements. So we do not even require that's a C and F. And a simple approach would be to transform the formula to DNF. Uh, then we have a cube, which is a conjunction of theory literals, and uh, see if one of the cubes is consistent. And if this is the case, we know the formula is satisfiable, otherwise not. However, this approach is not so good because uh, the transformation to DNF, the translation to DNF is expensive. And uh, now the obvious question is how can we do it better? And and the idea is um, yeah, to use a SAT solver for this, because a SAT solver is good uh, for solving propositional formulas. And what we can do is we can build an abstraction by introducing uh, propositional variables for the theory axioms. Ask the SAT solver, is there a solution for this um, abstraction formula? And if this is the case, we can translate the, um, the Boolean uh, variables back to the theory literals and um, use um, use uh, the theory solver to check if the found model of the propositional abstraction is indeed a model of the 
uh, SMT formula. This approach is very modular, very flexible, and it's implemented in many state-of-the-art solvers today. Here I have an example how we can obtain the um, propositional skeleton, this abstraction, from a given formula. Uh, so first of all, we uh, perform some uh, rewriting um, such um, that we have uh, only inequalities in the formula and uh, then uh, we replace the, the theory literals, these uh, predicates we have here, by a Boolean variable, so x smaller than y becomes a, x bigger than y becomes b, um, and uh, then we have some c, d, and e um, literals, which uh, variables which we introduce for theory literals, and we get a propositional formula a or b and c or not d and E. And uh, this is uh, an abstraction of the original formula and if this formula is already unsatisfiable we know that the original formula cannot be satisfiable because this is more constrained. Uh, but if it's satisfiable uh, then uh, we can um, give this um, map this um, solution back to the theory literals and uh, check the literals with uh, theory solver and um, if the solver can if the theory solver cannot prove the solution then a lemma is added to the uh, propositional skeleton so we say a and b and c and uh, there's a typo this c doesn't have to occur twice d and e uh, doesn't have to be in there twice or it can also be minimized and say uh, not A and B uh, will um, avoid the SAT solver to find the same uh, solution again. And uh, this is very nice. If we have this cost junction and negate it, then we get um, a clause. So the formula which, uh, which passed to the SAT solver was most likely in CNF. So this transformation we had to do. And as we know, CNF transformation is cheap. Uh, and uh, now we can simply add a clause to the formula. And um, hence we can use an incremental SAT solver which um, allows to um, incrementally uh, enrich a formula with clauses um, as long as um, the formula is uh, satisfiable. So adding a clause makes it more unsatisfiable. And or until uh, enough iterations have been performed. In our case, we can stop if the theory solver says that uh, the formula is uh, that the um, set of uh, theory literals represented by the assignment is consistent. So what we have here is we have um, 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 we have this lemmas on demand approach. The SAT solver finds a solution for the abstraction and uh, provides um, a variable assignment <coughs> if the formula is satisfiable. Um, in the case the formula is unsatisfiable, we are done because if the abstraction is unsatisfiable, then also the original formula cannot be satisfiable. Yeah, so in case uh, the formula is uh, the abstraction is satisfiable. Uh, this variable assignment is used to extract a set of theory literals and if this set is consistent we have a model for the SMT formula otherwise we extract an answered core so we extract a set of theory literals uh, that um, is inconsistent it, it's not necessary that it's the full set but only a subset uh, which is inconsistent and this information is then used to refine the abstraction in order to get a different model from the SAT solver. So uh, we enrich the abstraction by lemmas. Here I have a pseudocode written down of the idea I just explained. So for example, we have um, equality and uninterpreted functions. Um, and we want to know if uh, this uh, formula, this SMT formula, or this EOF theory 
is satisfiable or not, and if it is the case, we return satisfiable. So first of all, we build the propositional abstraction, which we call f. If uh, if um, if um, the um, yeah, and uh, the result variable r is set to unsatisfiable, and the set of assignment the, the assignment is empty at the moment. So first of all, we solve uh, this abstraction, um, and we get a result and um, and an assignment. In case the formula is satisfiable, I mean, if it's if it's unsatisfiable, then we, we immediately quit and um, return unsat. Uh, otherwise, we have an assignment, and the assignment this assignment is used to extract a set of theory literals, which is then passed to a theory solver. If the theory solver says this uh, set is consistent, then we return true. Otherwise, uh, we use the minimal answered core of um, of the assignment or of the set of theory literals for refining F uh, by just negating this uh, conjunction, which gives us a clause, as I have explained before. And uh, yeah, here is a formal definition of the mon minimal unsatisfiable core. We have given an unsatisfiable <coughs> set of constraints. Um, this can be um, theory literals, literals, or clauses. And um, the MOS, the minimal unsatisfiable core, is a subset of this uh, set such that the set still unsatisfiable and when I take something out of this set then it becomes satisfiable so it's the smallest unsatisfiable set um, <coughs> or it's a, it's one uh, it's a one uh, uh, unsatisfiable set of uh, such a size that it cannot be reduced anymore Okay, um, so this is the algorithm. Let's conclude with an example. Um, we have given this EOF formula, um, so it's in principle a conjunction, only here we have a disjunction included. Um, <coughs> we <coughs> first built the propositional abstraction. Um, we said g is equal, g of g of a is equal to b to 1. Uh, b and c are different, is not 2. Then g of a is equal to c is uh, propositional variable free. Um, then uh, this uh, here, this um, expression is abstracted by not four, and d is equal to e is uh, represented as five. Now we can pass this to a SAT solver, and the SAT solver says a model is one, not two, three, and five. And um, if uh, we have this. Uh, then we include uh, so four four is a don't care the not four and uh, we have only these uh, four um, theory literals to be considered and um, we can uh, figure out that this is unsat because g of a is equal to c g of a is equal to b so b is equal to c but B and C are different, therefore this is unsat. And uh, what we have to do is we have to um, refine uh, the formula and um, add um, this the negation of this model to the formula. So we have an additional clause. Next we ask the SAT solver for a solution and we get a model 1, not 2, not 4 and 5. Um, now we can again ask is this theory consistent? Um, then uh, we have these four theory literals and again this is uh, not the case, this is not theory consistent. Um, why? Uh, G of a is equal to b, so we have f of b is different from f of b, so this is answered. And uh, if we do one more iteration and pass this um, negated uh, model to the SAT solver, 
we um, get an unsatisfiable formula, so the abstraction cannot be further refined and we can conclude that the formula is unsatisfiable. Yeah, this is a very uh, simple approach um, with these lemmas on a demand to uh, solve uh, an SMT formula to integrate uh, SAT solver and Fury solver in a very loosely coupled manner. In, in practice it's uh, done in a more uh, integrated manner and this uh, gives us a, more, a, a tighter integration leading to the CDCLT approach, but this I will not discuss in this course.